Amen. Amen. We bless God for today. Today is the resurrection day. And uh, we, we are just remembering what Jesus did for us. What God did for us through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And so, um, we, without taking much of your time, uh, I'm blessed to have my brother here to give us the word. And uh, he, he is a good friend. And it's no, when somebody is a friend for a long time, they turn from friend to brother. That, that's, that's what happens. So um, if, if you should ask me, if I seriously want to talk to somebody, who should I call? This is the guy I call. Amen. We can be on the phone for hours talking. We talk everything. We, we don't hide anything. He knows everything about me. If you want to know anything about me, ask him. Because we came far from Ghana. Amen. Amen. His Reverend Yao Opoku Ajima. And uh, um, I don't want to talk about his degrees and where he went to school and all those kind of stuff. His wife, Emilia, is, uh, she, she is a CPA, Chartered Accountant, and uh, actually, when I was a teaching assistant at the University of Cape Coast, I taught her. <laughs> I taught her econ economy of Ghana. Yes, yes. So we bless God for that. Uh, they were here for the first service to bless us, and I want you to put on your seatbelt as you wait and hear the word of God from a seasoned Christian, somebody who really loves the Lord and is in the Lord's vineyard. He's in one of the biggest churches of AG in Virginia called Christ Chapel. He's uh, one of the board members there, a reverend minister, and so of Assemblies of God, you know. So if we go to heaven and God asks me, how many people did you encourage to become pastors? He's my trophy. <laughs> Amen. So, Brother Yao, will you come and give us the word? Amen. God bless you. I love you, man. God bless you. Thank you, church, for your love. As Pastor said, we've been here before. I believe this is probably my fourth visit. And there's every reason to sing about joy because our God does so many things for us that should provoke joy in our hearts, joy in our soul. Not only does he do things for us individually, he does marvelous things for his church. And for those of us who saw many years ago this church, and particularly the way in which the worship went. I remember when it started at first, Mrs. Gloria, Mrs. Afeni, and one other lady during my first visit here were the three people singing. They did their best. But truth be told, it's not what we are seeing today. And it reminds me that our God is a God of increase. Not only that, just the physical infrastructure, this facility, and the expansion, and the beauty, and the technology, and all of this, 
It is true that God is the one behind it, but God uses his people to do it. He uses our obedience. He uses our giving. He uses our cooperation together as members of his body focused on his agenda. And I want to thank you for your sacrifices. You know, COVID has done so many things against the body of Christ. A couple of Sundays ago, after I finished teaching in our church, my wife and I drove to see a church in our area, an Assemblies of God church, that is essentially in coma, ready to die. I say that because literally, although there remain a handful of people there, the church has been struggling mightily. It's in debt. The numbers have shrunk. The physical building is in disrepair. And we just went there just to see. That's even among the good stories. There are churches that has closed completely. Because COVID did not allow us to have life as we knew it normally. And unfortunately, churches have suffered. But you come to Philadelphia, you come to Gerald Street, you come to Overbrooks, and what you see is increase. What you see is growth. Your pastor just told you that we talk. And I know about individuals who cannot make it to church here and who send in their giving in the course of the week. It takes someone with a certain heart to do that. And it's an expression of your trust in his leadership. Not just him. But all the people, the deacons here, the board members, all of you who are lay leaders and working, and I pray that the Almighty God, who alone rewards, will himself be your exceeding great reward. Yeah. Let us pray. Our Father, we want to thank you for who you are and for your grace, your mercy, your love. You are such a good, good father. God, this day there is joy in our hearts because of you. But for you, where would we be? It is you who died and rose again. And because you live, the scripture says we will live also. And the songwriter reminds us that we can face tomorrow. Father, thank you that by the resurrection power, we are victorious. And this morning, God, in unity of faith with your servants and your people here gathered, I pronounce defeat over every work of the devil. Amen. And I pray, God, that you will bring such a release to your people. Father, meet them at the point of their need. Liberate your people. Bless your people. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. He's risen. Out of the grave, he arose. The Lord Jesus Christ. His reason. He has defeated death. He has overcome the demonic host in the dark domain. I like that song. Up 
from the grave, the songwriter said, he arose. Now, brothers, the event we are talking about, what you and I call the resurrection of Christ, is the greatest event in human history. Nothing has changed the course of human history and experience more than the resurrection of Christ. We are here gathered this afternoon because of his resurrection. Millions around the world, many of them clad in white like my sisters here, are singing praises to God because he who died is out of the grave. Seated at the right height side of the Father. Making intercession for you and I. Able to hear us. Able to empathize with us. Able to sustain us. That's our God. Brothers and sisters, every blessing you and I have is made possible because of the resurrection. From our salvation to our justification, that is where God Almighty, though you and I were guilty because of sin, on the account of his son Jesus Christ, looks at us, not as sinners, not as guilty criminals, and pronounces us not guilty. This is where he credits us with his righteousness. So that we who should have died live. The resurrection of Christ is everything. But brothers, before he resurrected, he was murdered. And if you look at Luke 23, we're not going to read it in the interest of time. The chapter begins with a very terrible, terrible miscarriage of justice. If it were today, I imagine we would take to the streets, those of us who knew Jesus, with placards and whistles and everything else people use today to protest injustice. And maybe block roads and do whatever it, we could do to get attention. Here was the Lord Jesus Christ. The God man who came and for years on earth went about doing good. Feeding the hungry. Healing the sick. Delivering the oppressed, bringing hope to the hopeless, the great teacher whose lessons were so practical, people who did not have insight and wisdom got it the minute they sat under his feet. Here was the Lord Jesus Christ who knew no sin, paraded before Pilate, accused falsely. And the crowd and the chief priests standing, incensed against him, clamoring for his death. Pilate knew, deep within him, this is an innocent man. This man is not guilty of the things being proffered against him. And yet, we are told he caves to pressure condemns the Son of God, sentences him to die, and orders him taken away. As their custom was, they will first scourge the victim. They will use the Roman flag room to whip the condemned criminal. The intent was to inflict so much pain to make him weak so that by the time they nailed the criminal to the cross, 
Just like that. No resistance, no energy, and you die. Crucifixion is the most barbaric instrument of execution ever invented by man. First invented by the Persians, borrowed and perfected by the Romans, crucifixion was intended to drag out a victim's suffering. You lay on that tree, held up, nails to your hands, panting for breath, and then you just suffered and suffered and suffered and suffered and suffered before you eventually die. Brothers and sisters, that's the kind of agony the Lord endured. And all this time as he was going through this, on the road to Golgotha, these holy women, Mary, Madeline, Joanna, other holy women, they were following, witnessing, just experiencing such horror that he was going through. And then we come to his death, his burial, and these women go home. I imagine they were depressed because he who they had believed, he who they had put their hope in, the one they would run to in the event of any problem is gone. Now you remember that Martha and Mary, when their brother Lazarus was sick, who did they call? The Lord Jesus Christ. You remember that, right? He delayed on purpose. He comes. He pronounces Lazarus, commands him to come out of the grave. And he who was dead came out. That's the Lord. That's the one they had trusted. And now he's gone. We open in chapter 24, beginning from verse 1. And the Bible says, now on the first day of the week. We are moving from tragedy now to triumph. On the first day of the week, that Sunday morning, brothers and sisters, that day and every such day, such as today, is a special day. It marks the beginning of the church worshiping the Lord. It is called the day of the Lord. It ended the old Sabbath, where on Saturday the saints of God gathered. It was meant to celebrate this great event we call the resurrection of Christ, Easter. On that day, early in the morning, certain other women came to the tomb, bringing spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away, and then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord. A brother read the, um, the version in the book of John. What are they doing again? They saw him buried. Why are they at the tomb? Well, on Friday, Joe did it hurriedly. And here they are, they are there to anoint the body of the one they love with spices and aloes to preserve it, to make sure it was cared for. That's what they wanted to do. An expression of their love and their respect for Christ. Only for them to show up. The stone is gone. There's nobody. Scripture says they stood there perplexed unsure of what to do. What happened to my Lord? Where have they taken him? And as they stood there like that, you keep reading with me, and from verse 4, we are told that they showed up two angels. Two angels come on the scene and listen to the question the angels asked the ladies say, why do you seek the living amongst the dead? Why? 
Why? Why seek the living amongst the dead? Now, who is this living? We came here looking for a corpse. We came here looking for his lifeless body. What do you mean, the living? Well, he's not here, he says. He's risen. He's risen. Out of the grave, he arose. He arose a victor from the dark domain. He who was laid dead, death could not contain him. There's a, a song we sing, my spirit magnifies the Lord. My soul praises his name. For death could not hold him captive. Even in the grave, he is Lord. Brothers and sisters, Jesus lives. Jesus is alive. Jesus is not dead. Jesus the Christ has risen. And you and I, as children of God, have every reason to have joy in our hearts. Joy in our souls. Now you say, why? What's the big deal? Let me very hurriedly give you a few reasons why this is such a big deal. Brothers and sisters, number one, if indeed he rose. Now remember what the angel said. The angel said, don't you remember that he told you? Don't you remember what he told you? That he will be killed and on the third day rise? And then the women immediately remembered. Because you see, on at least three occasions, the Lord prophesied about his own death and resurrection. He did that. Right after his transfiguration, he told them, they will arrest me, they will torture me, they will bury me, and on the third day, I will rise. On his final journey to Jerusalem, with all the disciples, he repeated the same thing. I will be arrested, I will be tortured, and on the third day, I will rise. And if he has risen, what's the implication of that? What does it mean? I tell you what it means. It means he is who he says he is. It means that when he said he was the son of God, he was the son of God. It means that when he said he was the Messiah, he was the Messiah, the Christ. It means that every word that came out of his mouth can be believed and relied upon. That is why, brothers and sisters, we hold his scriptures with conviction. This is why we believe in his inerrancy and his authority. This is why we can take a promise from this scripture and believe God to work it out in our lives. The Bible says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, not a word out of my mouth shall go unfulfilled. Jesus is who he says he is. I tell you something else it means. It means the Lord Jesus Christ is unique. Brothers and sisters, I said he is unique. The extent from anyone who has ever lived in all through human history. Listen, even the Bible recalls some resurrections. Lazarus is one, the son of uh, uh, the, 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 the one from, from uh, uh, Cain, the son, is one. Others, even in the Old Testament, there were resurrections that happened. You remember? Do you know all of those individuals died again? Do you know all of those resurrections involve a human agent? In the case of the Old Testament, the prophet Elisha, right? He prayed, and that woman's son came back to life. You remember? In the case of Lazarus, it was the Lord Jesus Christ himself who prayed, and he came back to life. All of those resurrections involved a human agent. The only resurrection in recorded history that did not require anybody is that of Christ. Not only that... He is the only one who died, rose again, and lives forever. Amen. He lives forever. Brothers, if you go looking for his tomb today, he is not there. Just as we read a short while ago about the empty tomb, the Lord is not there. The women went. 
did not find it. Peter comes in next. He did not find him. They were all wondering. Before he began to reveal himself, in all of those appearances, at one point appearing to over 500 people, even when they were in a room that was locked, boom, came the Christ. That's Jesus Christ. That is Jesus Christ. And this is something that must be told. For you and I who are Christians, this has enormous implications. The resurrection of Christ has enormous implications. Brothers and sisters, Paul argues that if the preaching of the gospel is going to be valid, Jesus needed to rise from the grave. Without it, he says, in 1 Corinthians 15 and 14, that the preaching of the gospel is vain. Our faith is vain. The apostles were false witnesses. We are still in our sins. Believers are perished at death. Christians are to be pitied of all men. What would be the point for you and I to be here today singing, giving, working, preaching, and everything we do if Christ were still in the grave? What would make him different from any other person? This is why Christianity is not on the same level as other religions. Don't let anybody fool you. Oh, we are all God's children. Oh, every road leads to... The... No, 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 no. That's why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Exclusive authority. Exclusive. Brothers and sisters, the gurus and prophets of all these religions died and they remain dead. It is only Christ, the Savior of the world, who died and lives forever. Let me read you a scripture. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, he says, And when I saw him, this is John the Beloved, he has met the Lord Christ, and he's describing what he saw. And he said, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his hands, his right hand on me, saying to me, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And then listen to what he asked. He says, I have the keys of Hades and death. I have the keys of Hades and death. This is the Lord saying, I have overcome death. Brothers, listen to me. This is why, as Christians, we don't fear death. No, we don't. I don't suggest you put yourself in harm's way and die. That would be foolish. I don't suggest you don't protect yourself during a pandemic. That would be foolish. But brothers, you don't live your life terrified of death. Because the sting of death has already been taken away. And if you and I die today, it's only a doorway to eternity. Because absent from this body, we'll be present with the Lord. Amen. This is why we go through life with faith and conviction and hope. Because of what the Lord has done. What are the implications, brothers and sisters? It assures that when he says your sins are forgiven, by the grace of God, they are forgiven. When he says that you and I are justified, he was raised for our justification. When he says to you that, hey, I can help you, the Bible actually speaks to it. The Lord Jesus Christ is able to help you and I because he lives ever to make intercession for us. He is able to do that. He is able to do that. Listen to the book of Hebrews. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, before his ascension, there was his resurrection. Who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way. I just told you the agony he went through. I just told you the abuse he went through. I just told you the mistreatment he went through. Sister, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know. My wife is counseling right now with a Christian sister who is going through terrible, terrible abuse in her marriage. Just terrible. One of those things when you hear the details and 
if it were possible, you want to grab the guy and slap him. I don't know what you are going through now, but hear me out. You have a high priest who is able to empathize. And listen to the reading. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with confidence. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Children of God, we are not exempt from trouble in this world. But because he lives. Because he ever lived to make intercession for us. You and I can go before the throne of grace and embed in our hearts where God who hears. Just cry out to him. And I was telling someone, people like this abuser that I talked about, it's only a matter of time. Because the saints are praying. God's people are praying. It's only a matter of time. And I want you to encourage yourself. I want you to know that there is a God who sees your tears. I want you to know that there's a God who is able to pull you through. I want you to know that the God of heaven can help you in every way because he's God. You know why? Because he has already defeated Satan and the forces of evil. These are the ones orchestrating human misery. These are the ones behind our troubles. They know that having believed in the gospel, you are on your way to eternal life. Something they have permanently missed out on. And they are determined to place as many roadblocks in your way, as many hindrances in your way, as many challenges in your way. They are determined to do that. And there is a God in heaven who says, ah, 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 not my child. Not this time. You've already had your time. I'm alive. I'm alive to rescue them. I'm alive to deliver them. Listen to the scriptures. It says, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age which is to come. No one is left out. All of the minions of hell are included here. Scripture says, when he raised him from the grave, he has seated him far above them. Far above them. That is why we cannot go through life as cowards. That is why we cannot go through life as people who are terrified. If you have believed the gospel, and if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you can have confidence and walk with your chest out knowing that your back is covered. That your God is with you. That Emmanuel is with you ever to help you, ever to increase you, ever to expand your territory. That is our God. And this is what he does. But in the interest of time, listen to me. This resurrection has made available to you and I the power to live. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ who lives within me. It is because he's alive and lives within us. That is why we can live for God. That is why in the face of temptation, we can still do the right thing. That is why we can have married that reflects his glory. That is why we can raise our children to fear God. That's why we can do the right thing, even when it costs us. Because he lives within us to empower us, to help us, to enable us to live for him and to save him. It's only because he has sent that he sent forth the power of the Holy Spirit that enables you and I to now live and to save him. And listen to me. Not only has he defeated the enemy, the scripture says, and the very God of peace will place Satan under your feet shortly. He will place them under your feet. Listen to what he told us. He said, behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and upon scorpions and over every power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing. That's what the resurrection has made available. But brothers, here is the best of the benefits. It assures that you and I, by the grace of God, have hope for our own resurrection. 
Brothers and sisters, we will not die and perish. The God who came out of the grave has said, I will take you to where I am. It's why I love the song we sang. Because he lives. I can face what? Tomorrow. Because he lives. All fear is gone. And now I know he holds what? The future. And life is worth the living. Why? Because he lives. Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. Someday we may put down this, incor- this corruptible flesh. If he tarries, but make no mistake. A child of God does not die. A child of God just sleeps and switches from life to eternity with his father. We have hope that we ourselves will be resurrected because the corruptible must put on the incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible have put on incorruption and this mortal have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can you see Paul mocking death? He says, where is thy sting? You are too known, as we say in Ghana, death, you are too known. You talk too much. You make people afraid too much. Where is thy sting? Jesus has taken the sting out of death for you and I. And someday, by the grace of God, we will be able to be resurrected and spend eternity with him. Brothers, everything I told you comes to this. The Lord raised him to be Lord of all. Jesus the Christ is Lord of all. And if he is Lord, if he is Lord of both life and death, and he is. If he is Lord of everything, the word means, Greek word is curious, controller, master, the one in charge of everything. If he is Lord, then let me end with this. How should you and I respond to him? If he is Lord. If Jesus is Lord, how should I walk with him? How should I relate with him? How should I respond to his incredible sacrifice? To his incredible death? How should I respond to the news that he is raised from the grave for my sake? I'll tell you how we should do it. I will just read just one scripture and show you how the Lord will have us do it. You see... We are told in 2 Corinthians 5.15 that he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. Brothers and sisters, that's how we respond. We live for him. Paul said, I no longer live. It's Christ who lives within me. For me to die is gain, he says, and to live is Christ. Children of God, the best way to respond to this incredible sacrifice, to this amazing grace, is for you and I to live for God. To live for God. To begin to do things that will honor Him. To submit to His Lordship. To obey Him. To want to please Him. To make it our goal to live for Him. If we do that, then all will be well. And finally, finally, brothers and sisters, because it's alive, I can be confident of his rewards for me, for the things I do, for the things he asks me of me. Everything you and I are doing, the coming together to pray, the coming together to fast, the sacrificing to give money, the coming for rehearsals, the training of our children in children's ministry, the training of our youth, everything we do. And even on your own secular job, because he reigns there too. Your work as a nurse, bringing the things of God to bear and to bring relief 
to all these people that are suffering. Listen to me. Whatever it is you do, scripture says keep doing it. Keep doing it because you know that your reward will not be in vain. God is a rewarder. And that God who lays will reward you and make you great. We are going to pray. And I don't know what burdens brought you here today. But whatever it is, I want you to understand that the God in whom you have trusted, he is able to break the yoke and set you free. I want you to know that all of the areas you are believing him to touch, listen, he has all power over all things at all times. We call it omnipotence. Your God is omnipotent. And he's able to do all of those things. Please, let's rise on our feet and take a minute. Just cry out to the Lord. Thank him for his amazing sacrifice. And tell him, Lord, I'm rolling this burden onto you. And let's see him go to work on your behalf. Let's begin to pray. Call out. Call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord. Believe God to touch you. The Bible says that the spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the grave will quicken your mortal body. Tell God, Lord, touch me in this area. If it's your marriage, I want you to talk to him about it. And let's believe this God to take charge. God is able.